Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Sexsmith Mayor Kate Potter. But before we do, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to the countless viewers and followers who have followed us along for this journey. We are wrapping up here at the end of December for a month. We're taking a hiatus for the winter month of January, and we have some amazing shows coming up. So if you can, please hit that subscribe button and follow button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, on to our interview. Kate, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always great to sit down with someone who I've had on the municipal affairs in your role as the municipals. But I'm bringing you on to the cross border interviews to talk about yourself and the town of Sexsmith. I want to start with my very first question that I've asked many municipal leaders from across Canada, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kate? Well, thanks for the question. Thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited. Um, I have always loved politics and I grew up in a family where, uh, my dad, uh, and both my parents encouraged us to be involved in every opportunity to, uh, to lead or to have our voices heard. And so we used to watch elections as though they were like the gray cup. There was food and yelling and cheering <laughs> and cheers sometimes, <laughs> Um, but it really drove, I think, um, part of my awareness in uh, politics and and how things get done. So the importance of being involved and in, on all the levels, whether it was municipal or provincial or federal. Um, and then as I, I don't know, got older and and um, got involved in community and got involved in in just different organizations. I realized that so much of what uh, impacts those organizations, particularly at the municipal level, is decided by the people who sit around the council table in that community or in that uh, in that region, and and so it just continued to grow and grow. And finally, I thought about it for a number of years, and I think everybody, you're in one of two boats. Either you think about it for a long time. And then you finally decide to take the plunge or you're like the last minute, oh, somebody just mentioned it to me yesterday and the sheets or your nomination papers are due tomorrow. <laughs> so so I was part of the, I've been thinking about it a long time. I still don't know, and my husband would say this, uh, that it was probably the wrong timing because my kids were uh, two and four when I first joined municipal politics. And that made for some crazy times, but I have loved every single minute of it. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there, and I, I want to start with the general question to get the sort of line of questioning off the bat, and that is, why municipal? Because I, I can imagine you could have chosen many different routes. You could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen school board. But at the end of the day, when you decided that you were thinking about putting your name forward for elections, you decided municipal would be the best location for you to serve what was it about the municipal allure that drew you to it i think because i love community and and more than anything i mean i'm a i'm a proud canadian i am uh i mean people don't like the word patriot but i'm i'm really patriotic i'm a big supporter of um of having strong identity and where you come from and and your background, whatever that is. Um, but the community aspect of being in a municipality or or you know, and and I'm assuming it's the same for people who live in a county or a rural area. Um, you identify with that group of people, and you that is where kind of my first love is when I think of the people who I talk to every day, who impact me every day. And, and the ones that when I say I want to make the world a better place, they're the people that I think of first. And so I think that's why municipal politics were so appealing. It's also, I mean, people often think of it as stepping stones and, uh, and to be totally upfront, 
I did. So I, I ran for um, municipal politics and then our provincial, uh, the provincial election came up and the writing association I was a part of had a space. And I did put my name in, in that nomination, which I didn't win, but it opened my eyes to provincial politics. And I've said it ever since I will never, ever go back. <laughs> I love, love municipal politics. And, uh, and I, I don't know that I would serve on the other levels given some of the drama and <laughs> you, you peek behind the curtain and you don't like how the sausage is made is what you're telling me <laughs> yes 100 percent. it is not my cup of tea <laughs> so uh, if since you brought it up i'm gonna sort of poke the bear a little bit but do you mind saying which party you decided to run for and i, I i'm not trying to get political here just for i've asked m- numerous people who've said they've ran or wanted to run or decided to try and yeah. run provincially so for you what was the party that you were looking at running for so I ran for the UCP in, uh, and I'm in Northern Alberta. So um, the the conservatives here have a long history and well, actually we've never elected anybody except conservatives. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I am by nature, I, I am more conservative and I in general adhere to conservative principles. Um, yeah, and so it was a really no, good fit. I, I appreciate your honesty and your candor there. I want to get back to the municipal because that's why we're here and that's why I love chatting about municipal politics like with guests like you who are so bubbly and so lively <laughs> and so engaged. Um, you decide to put your name forward, and correct me if I'm wrong here, in the 2017 general election, right? Correct. You say you, and you've openly said this on the uh, in the interview so far, that you were hammering around the idea of putting your name forward prior to that uh and then in 2017 you finally bite the bullet and you pull the trigger and you go what was it about that time because you say you and your husband would probably your husband would probably say (laughs) probably wasn't the most appropriate time with young kids but you make the decision you to say okay this is the time that kate's gonna do it she's gonna put her name on the ballot and see where things lie what was going on in 2017 in the town or in the community that you said I need to do something about this. I think um, one of the biggest uh, driving factors was um, number one, talking to people about a change needed in council that they just weren't seeing partially from, from people who had already put their names forward. And, um, and I looked at our community and, and thought we could go so far. Like there is so much potential here and I love, I love a good challenge. I love helping things move better. I love moving forward. And I'm, you know, as I watch rural, smaller communities across the country, most are dying. And that's a really sad, yeah, a really sad situation to me that, that, that those communities for um, either intention, I don't want to say intentionally, Either there's been intentionality and choices made that has not helped that community move forward. Sometimes there are um, impacts from outside influences that you can't control. But I looked at Sexmans. We have a long history. We were the British, uh, the sorry, the grain capital of the British Empire. We've we've had huge, you know, huge successes in Sexmans history, and here we are. We're right at this cusp of either. We just coast into non-existence or coast into the our neighborhood, larger municipalities taking us over, or we say, hey, we can do some awesome things here and we're not just going to roll over and die. <laughs> and I don't think council would have never said that was their intent at all, the people who are on there. And I'm I'm thankful when I was <laughs> when I was elected, there there were two of us that were new and there were five incumbents who were reelected. And and it was a good mix. It was a great introduction to to municipal politics and why we do certain things a certain way and why they had been done a certain way, which of course you don't know that when you're looking in from the outside. So so for me, there was just it was a culmination of a number of of those things. I also am slightly competitive. And so, so slightly come on. Yeah, I know you might get some disagreement from my council or my family, but um, yeah, so slightly competitive. And a, a friend of mine had 
called me and said, hey, I've decided to run. Uh, will you sign my nomination paper? And that, that tiny little spark was like, oh, maybe it's time. Now, thankfully, he was elected at the same time. And so, so there was no like, oh, no. I beat you and you're not lucky. <laughs> yeah, that could have ended poorly, but I'm really thankful it didn't. So you have now served for six years on your council and you have been mayor. Uh, I apologize if I'm getting this wrong, but for this term only, correct? Uh, no, I was actually elected as mayor in 2018. So so the so council votes for the mayor? Oh, yeah, by, oh no. okay. Yes. So unfortunately, one year into our fir my first term, our mayor passed away in office. And um, obviously that was a major, yeah, just a, a huge situation to deal with as a council. He had been a long-term serving mayor and counselor and, and fell sick. And so, um, so that created obviously a void, but it also created a by-election and, um, and I was fortunate enough to have the support of the majority of my fellow council members who said, Kate, we think you should run for mayor at that time. Um, there was another councillor who ran as well. So it actually opened up two council positions and a mayor's position. So we we did the by-election in December of 2018. Okay. So this, this changes a few questions that I have because you have been on council for six years, five years as mayor. And you are a self-described, and I'm putting words in your mouth here a little bit, but you are a self-described political nerd. And yes. I want to pick up <laughs> on something that you said in that last statement prior to talking about the by-election. You said the inside look, the outside looking in, because when you're not on council, you think you know how council is going to do yeah. things. But once yeah. you get elected and you are sitting behind that table, it is a whole new ball game. So I've got to ask, and I know this is kind of a weird question because you have a year as a councillor, five years as mayor. Was it what you expected? I, I'm i going to say yes. Um, so coming onto council, that opened my eyes to just so many different things. And I was really thankful that I had had a couple of uh, previous councillors who said, okay, here's some things that you should know coming into the, into the role. Okay. And then the previous mayor had sat down with me on a couple of occasions and just said, um, just sort of walked me through some things that I don't know that I probably would not have known had he not done that very intentionally. And, and I want to be careful because it's not my, totally my story to tell but I think he was intentional in what he was doing because he knew his own situation and and so trying to get people prepared for this even though he had not shared his personal situation he was a very private man but in his own way he was prepping people to not not for me to take over but to think he was about laying the groundwork to lay the seeds of uh, an uh, sort of succession plan. Exactly, exactly. And he didn't know what the timing of that would be, but he did open my eyes to a few things that I wasn't, I wasn't totally aware of yet. Being on council, having only served one year, so the relationship with our neighboring municipalities, or um, how to try and get things done when working with the province or the feds, or, you know, there's so many little things like that or stuff that he found really important. And so I had that privilege of, of him just, just letting me know some things. And so when I got into the role as mayor, I also, I think I was also blessed because, because I had majority support from my counselors, the ones who were remaining, they were very gracious with me <laughs> in those first years. And of course, the council's reeling. Most of those councillors had been on for a number of years and knew the previous mayor quite well. They knew I was brand new. And, and so were very gracious in, in helping me understand different things as I went along. 
And so nothing to me was just totally shocking. Like, oh no, like I was not prepared for that. And now I am sinking. <laughs> I don't, I don't ever remember that a moment like that. And I appreciate that, but it begs the question while you are, you, there wasn't that anything that was shocking or something that sort of stood out to you saying, okay, I wasn't prepared for this. You can't be prepared for the backlash that municipal politicians get. And I know you, you're laughing at it, but it's true because you know, after six years in office, you are not going to please a hundred percent of the people. (laughs) I don't care who you are, what (laughs) community you live in. I say this all the time. You're not going to please 100% of the people. So in your time in office, have you found a way to balance that understanding that you have to make the tough choices and you're not going to please everyone, but you have to do it because you have to move the community forward? Yeah, I think that that comes with the territory. You The longer you serve the more I think you just get used to that. But it also defines you can are, are you a better wanna... are you a better counselor slash mayor now than you were when you first were elected when you were trying to potentially please everyone to say a hundred percent. And what what makes what makes you a better person in that way then? Um I think well first of all understanding how the system works, understanding that, um, like you said, what is right or the best decision in a circumstance is not the one that everybody loves. It's saying, okay, once I have all the information, I need to make a decision and I need to be confident that whatever I vote for, I've made the best decision in that moment possible. I think too, like being in this role can do one of two things. One, it makes you more apathetic and hate people. Or two, it drives your compassion and you love people more, even though sometimes they're really annoying. (laughs) And and it's just, it's hard to (laughs) to put words, but I hope that I am the second of that. That the longer I've been here, the more compassion I have for people who are understanding or trying to understand how decisions are made or or are trying to just you know they want to be heard and they want someone on the inside to say you know what I appreciate you saying it this is why we chose otherwise but I my door is always open and and that to me has made me a better counselor and a better mayor is taking the time to talk to everyone even if I completely disagree, I should point out my dear husband has just walked in. He's he is one hundred percent my sport. Oh, he's gonna say hi. Oh, okay. We're leaving that part in that. Okay. We're leaving it the way. Yeah, um, because a hundred percent, I would not be here without him. He's often the sounding board for me. But but really, that's what it is. Like if I can't take the time to talk to the to talk to the crazy people or the ones who are so over the top. Who's going to listen to them? They're usually not totally crazy. Like the number of 100% trolls that exist to me are very small in number. So uh, it begs it begs a question. And I love this conversation because I feel like we're actually talking and not just giving me talking points like provincial <laughs> and federal politicians. Is it more that they want to be heard or they actually want you to change your vote? Because in today's society, with social media the way it is, people yell into the void wanting to be heard by somebody and hopefully have someone change their mind. At the municipal level, though, some people just don't understand where to potentially point that frustration. And you as mayor, you as a councillor have to sort of be that sounding board for people, even if you don't agree with them, right? Right. Yeah. And, and it's one of the things I love about municipal politics versus um, other politics, Uh, (laughs) right, is that I get elected and my role really is to represent my community, regardless of who you vote for. Like, there's no politics attached to who I am there. I don't, I, I don't say, okay, I will always choose the most conservative option. I will always, whatever I'm saying do you like me as a person? Do you like what I represent in my values? Do you stand with me as far as 
Am I open? Am I willing to listen? And do I look at what I'm offering and say, if I've made an evaluation of something and I'm wrong, I'm willing to say that was a bad choice or no, you've convinced me otherwise. Is and, it hard to do that I, though? <laughs> oh, I'm like uber competitive. Remember, I love to win, <laughs> but but it's so critical. That's what people want. They want to know that you're just not stuck in the mud somewhere because it might be the right thing. They want to know that there's an opportunity to try and convince you, even if even if you don't change. So that's where the being heard to changing the vote, most people I find want to be at least heard. Yeah. That That is the absolute minimum care that they have is that someone is willing to listen and not just fight them on every single point. Just tell me where things are at. Some are open to hearing back. Some don't care to, and that's fine. Like they can choose that. I'm not, I have gained a, t a thicker skin <laughs> the longer I've been here where if my opinion's not heard, like that doesn't bother me because I sit around a table where my opinion gets heard on a very regular basis. And I know I have, I have the opportunity to share it and to vote and make a decision there. So when I'm talking to people, a lot of times, unless they're asking me questions, want to know the background, or I can say, okay, you know what? I'm not the right person to talk to. You need to go talk to your MLA or to this body or organization that I, I love doing. I love the education piece of that because it helps people know where to put their frustration. Otherwise, most people just want to be heard. Over the last six years, you probably have had to make some very tough choices and you impact your residents the day after you make those tough choices. And you're not in Edmonton doing your job. You're not in Ottawa making those choices. You are in yeah. your community. And the next morning, you might have to go out and drop your kids off at school. You may have to go pick up milk at the corner store. And that means that conversation that you just had at council the night before yeah. is going to be spread like wildfire in the community and people are going to know. And they will want to talk to you about that. Is it hard to do a job in a small community like yours where you impact your residents and then that means your life is not Kate the moment after you make a decision. You are the mayor 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yeah, it is. It is hard. And I see the impact particularly on my family when we go places. Um, and, and I've learned over time to, to try and diffuse those things when when I get hit with something at an unknown time or a surprise surprise uh, it's not an attack but a surprise moment um, I usually try to schedule something coming I just say you know what now it's not a great time I'm here with my kids or whatever um, that usually takes care of that I mean the hard decisions there will always be hard decisions and there will always be tough moments. I mean, I think we all saw it and I hate to bring up COVID because everybody's tired of it, but, but we saw it during COVID and I think small towns experienced it. I don't want to say even more like a, the, you, you look at the premiers and the prime minister, they got a lot. Our MLAs got some too, but you always schedule those things because in general, you don't see them at every grocery store at every, every school meeting or, or anything like that. And, and because like my phone number that is on my business card is my personal phone number. So everybody in town has it. Everybody knows where I live. So, you know, they walk by and <laughs> garage sale and whatever it is. Um, and so. Is it challenging to balance that? Because I can imagine there's days you just want to be Kate. You just want to go to the grocery store, <laughs> grab a carton of milk or grab a bag of chips. And you're like, uh, gray tracksuit and just come home but you know you might be stopped is it hard to <laughs> balance that lifestyle because you seem like you want the best for your community and you're willing to chat to people when you're out there but there's days that your mental capacity can't just handle it and you want to just be kate and go <laughs> i want to eat ice cream watch dawson's <laughs> creek tonight and just sit in my throat at home is there days you get there 
Uh, yes. I mean, on those days, I normally don't go outside my house as much as possible. No, I mean, well, and it's true. Okay, I will be the first to admit that sometimes I come around an aisle in a grocery store, and depending on who is down that aisle, I sometimes forget that I need those things and move to the next aisle. I. Every we'll person look. in Sexsmith is watching this right now is going, has she done that to me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or don't answer the phone call. Um, I mean, yeah, we all have those times. I would say, okay, and this is maybe a little bit off script and a little bit crazy, but I'm just going to say it anyway. So I think one of the things that that is that is part of the reason why people... I don't know. So my faith makes a big difference in how I treat people because I look at my own life and times where I've been really passionate about something. And then to have someone willing to say, you know what? I hear you. I could totally disagree with you, but I hear you. And I know where it's coming from. I know it's coming from a love for their family, for their community, it's coming from um, hurt that they've experienced in the past. It gives me so much compassion for them. And, and that drives how I treat people, even on the days where I feel like I just don't want to see anybody else or I'm so tired. I get to the end of the day and we always have our council meetings in the evening, which I understand for small towns, but some days it's like, okay, people, <laughs> like we have been through a lot of stuff. And I really don't want to deal with, you know, counselors who aren't getting along or somebody who's extra spicy because they've had a tough day or whatever it is. But my faith does push that for me. And so it makes me think what is really important for them as a person? And is it, is it always it is more important for me to treat them well and to hear them even in this moment where I'm hurting or I'm frustrated or whatever. Um, does that, yeah, does that re reflect my actual values? Right. And, and so, so it's a, it's a bit of a weird one for me. I'm, I'm open about faith, but I, I'm very careful because I know in my position that I can be, um, I have a lot of influence in places and so I don't want to abuse that but for me that's what drives what I do as well I want to pick up on this for a little bit here for a second but I'm going to ask you one second I'm going to cut this out if it's okay I, well I'm going to actually cut this out um do you need to take a moment right now are you okay like I don't no, want to continue I, yeah are no you... I'm okay thank you though I appreciate that okay because yeah. this this next question and this is the last question I'm going to ask about the personal stuff and then we're going to get to the town issues sure um People are struggling right now. And I yeah. can imagine you know that more than anyone else who's, well, like other mayors and counselors, you know that you are playing a role in people's struggling. Oh, are you yeah. still there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm going to repeat that. Again. <laughs> Sorry, you just froze at the moment when I was talking and you were intently looking at me. I was like, did she freeze? <laughs> um, People are struggling right now, and you know that better than most people probably across this country as well. Mayors and councillors are about to go into their budget season, if they haven't already. Mm -hmm. And the affordability crisis is on the top of everyone's mind right now. And you play a role in that crisis because you have a community that you have to continue to move forward. You have services that people need. You have uh, community members who are going paycheck to paycheck right now. Mm -hmm. How do you see your role as mayor of your community in balancing that aspect of the job? Because hmm. this budget cycle is probably the hardest one you probably will have to go through because over COVID, and I know we don't like talking about it, but it, ha it happened and I have to ask the question. <laughs> I heard all the time from mayors that we had to cut the fat, we had to cut the trim, we had to cut to the bone of the service level so that way it didn't impact residents. We're not out of that situation yet, and yeah. service levels are not back to where they were pre-pandemic. So you are now at a point where you're trying to grow the community, but you're not trying to do it on the backs of the people who are there who are struggling. So how do you yeah. balance the growth with the individuals in your community? 
Well, you know, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to when looking through your budgets and your different departments and what's important. Um, part of it is, is prioritizing. Like that's the reality of our personal lives. It's the reality of government too. And it has to be. Um, I am very thankful for my predecessors here in Sexsmith. I haven't agreed with all of them, but overall they have actually done a really good job in setting us up well for coming into a time like this. And, and so when I look at this, I hope to do the same thing. Like as far as making sure we're taking care of what is absolutely necessary. And to me, what is absolutely necessary includes things like wellness, FCSS, like the social side of things too, those are absolutely necessary. What is not necessarily, what is not absolutely necessary, <laughs> um, and this is something we're exploring in sex with right now, is we're looking at our own council and saying, okay, we're a council of seven for just under 3,000 people. Uh, do we need to trim the, <laughs> do we need to trim the fat quite literally? So we are, we're exploring that right now. We have a bylaw at first reading that would move us to five count, uh, five member council, four councillors and a mayor. And um, so it's like, nothing is sacred. There are no sacred cows in the in the town of Sexsmith. Everything has to be justified because it is my neighbor who lives next to me, who's a senior and lives on a fixed income. It's the person who goes to school with my kids, the single mom, the family that is one income that is having, have, having just come out of COVID. Now they're making money, but they are, they're maxed out. Right. Yeah. And so all of those things have to play into it. Of course, it means hard choices, but, but I'm really thankful that when I talk with people about why we made the choice we did, they recognize because they're living it that everything is tough choices, right? So, so I actually find that most people are fairly understanding, even if they don't like what this investment. And I mean, we built a giant berm that prevents flooding on the north end of our community, which to me felt like a huge win and something we've been working on as a community for a number of years. And we had, we took some really uh, hard hits from residents who hated the whole thing like just and which shocked me a little bit considering we're preventing flooding of the entire community and again to... you're not going to please 100 percent of the people and all the issues get the mayor. i know i know but again shocked but no but then i thought um it's like but they know even in the end i would say 95 percent of the people i talk to aren't uh, living their life as trolls the whole time. They're passionate about something. And when we talk through it, they understand where I'm coming from, even if they disagree. And and that's, to me, that's a win. So on budget, I'm like, yeah, it means sometimes cutting one thing and and letting another go. It does mean being tight. Like we do not, our ultimate goal is that we grow with inflation and assessment, but not in tax increases. Like that's that's my ultimate goal as a as a council member. I do not ever want to see a tax increase that is that is us adjusting the tax rate up. Yeah. I want to turn to my second segment because I'm very cautious of time and we're already at the half hour mark because, you know, that's the great thing about these shows. <laughs> I forget that we're actually recording and we have a time limit. Um, I, uh, before I ask I this talk question. Too I talk but, too much. Hey, it's better than not talking at all on the on an audio video <laughs> of the show. Um, I want to uh, ask this question, but before I do, I want to preface it, as I always do, that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the mayor's <laughs> opinion. For those who are about to send emails, please send them to the crossborder photography at gmail.com. And please do not send them to the mayor because this is her opinion and you can yell at me and not her for once. Um, I want to ask, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Sexsmith today as of recording this episode? Um, okay, biggest issue, I would say, as a small town close to a big center is sustainability. And I, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things go into that. 
So not only financial, political sustainability, making sure you have the people who are passionate, who want to keep moving your community forward. Um, sustainability as far as um, safety, our nearest large community has just chosen to switch to a private municipal police force. And so, I mean, we do have a separate RCMP uh, division that takes care of rural, but it does have impact and there are concerns. Of course, our residents are concerned. So safety plays out in that all the time. Um, making sure that we are just being cognizant of our money management, what we're doing, like the sustainability thing to me and making it a great place to live still, right? You can do the very bare minimum, according to some people, which is making sure there is a road, making sure there is water and a functioning uh, wastewater system. And it's like, they would be happy with that. But that to me does not make a town. And the MGA is very clear. And I often tell people this, the MGA does not say, make a town that's functional. It's like, it specifically outlines in our responsibilities and the first preamble, it specifically outlines that to create, um, that you need to make decisions that make your community a good place to live. And that to me, I, I feel is intentional. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but, but it is intentional because that means thinking about our parks and our, support systems and whether or not our streets are gravel or paved or how we deal with that if they're either one right and so the sustainability is so much more than just are you viable to keep like do you make enough money to keep going it's like is your community worthwhile to continue to invest in and continue to do well part of that is financial part of it is other stuff I have done over 150 of these episodes with municipal leaders, and I am going to say this is the very first episode. This is episode 660, whatever we're at right now. Um, someone has quoted the MGA to me. <laughs> so <laughs> feel honored, feel blessed, but uh, counselors who are Political listening to this, heard. let's do it. Let's quote the MGAs to Chris Brown more often. Um <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I understand. I understand that sustainability is a big issue for you and for the town as a whole. But the million, the semi million dollar question that has to be asked is what do you do about it? What do you do <laughs> as mayor, as council to ensure that the political sustainability of your community, the safety sustainability of your community, the economic sustainability of your community and making your community a place where people want to go as you have said small town sort of canda is sort of declining a little bit right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i think it is really comes down to a 100 percent effort from everybody at the table like and and that's where to me if you don't have the right personalities you can have all the right policy that you want but if you have the wrong personalities or the wrong heart in positions you won't get the right result it doesn't matter if all the policies align and this is where I, when i see someone so i think of political sustainability when i see someone in my community who i think is engaged who takes the time to learn about issues who is, doesn't just fly off the handle easily, who thinks through things and is passionate about whatever it is in the community. They don't have to love everything about the community. Nobody's, uh, you know, can do everything. But if they're passionate and involved, then I go to those people and I say, you need to run. And I start that conversation. I have, I have a, a coffee. Actually, in the last two days, I've set up coffee with two different people to talk about running. Running is still two years away. But if we don't start now and we don't start talking about it regularly, they don't have the time to think about it. They can't consider the family implications, the community implications, the volunteer implications. There's so much that goes into it. So really being engaged that way, making sure you have the right people at least putting their name forward. Of course, you cannot guarantee who's gonna be elected. I don't know if I'll be here next term, but then once we have the people, it's encouraging them to stay focused and to stay passionate about why they're here. So some of our counselors are super passionate about economic development. They, they easily talk to all the business people. I hate schmoozing, hate it so much, but 
<laughs> I've learned to do it because of the role I'm in. And I have some counselors on our council who are awesome at it. They are they know the exact thing to say. They know how to bring things out. And so they've challenged our business community to say, okay, can you reinvest in assessment? What would make it possible for you to grow your business here rather than moving to another community where where you might be looking at expanding or saying to those, you know, when they run into people, we don't like to poach people. I mean, if I'm struggling, the town next door is also struggling. Even the city of Grand Prairie and the county of Grand Prairie, they have struggles too. So it's not just about poaching people into our community. It's about saying, okay, how can we find compliments to what we already have? You think of safety. So we have some fantastic community organizations, Citizens on Patrol, um, our Elks Club, um, some of our, even our smaller um, sports organizations that think outside the box when it comes to what's their role. So you've been given, and I think of, if I think of the Elks, you know, their main thing is is sort of being a charitable stat. Well, they're sort of an old boys club too, although that's changing. But um, but they're, they think about charity and giving to community groups and, and things like that. It's like, okay, so let's talk about, could you guys do... And in our community, this has happened where on the first day of school and for the first week of school, they go out and stand at the sidewalks and help our kids make sure that they cross the right way. And I'm like, and our community people love it. The Elks love it. There's connection right in the community. Is safety and, you know, making sure kids cross the street safely one of their mandates? No, it's not. But let's think outside the box a little bit. And yet people who are passionate in their realm, people who are passionate in our realm, working together and it just makes awesome things happen and drives so that everybody is thinking sustainability, not just us in our political corner, but we try and get everyone together on that. So on the show, I've been accused by a counselor from Alberta who shall not be named, uh, but I will because I like to throw people under the bus from time to time, but it was in joke accused that, uh, Brazo County Kara Westerland said that I only talk about the negative <laughs> issues about communities and she wanted to know when we were going to talk about the good things. And it was a good actual question because I think we need to talk about the good things that yes. communities are doing. So in your role as mayor, what do you boast about to other communities in your, in, in Alberta or even across Canada that you say, sex myth is doing it better. Sex myth has got it right on these issues. Okay, two things to me uh, come to mind. Well, maybe three. Okay, one is, <laughs> I mean, I might still talk for another 25 minutes here. No, um, okay, so number one for me is finances. And and I like this is probably the most boring part that people don't wanna hear. Um, but to me, it's a big, a big piece. Sexsmith is able to do a lot of things that other small communities are not because we have been smart with our money right from the beginning. We've reinvested in infrastructure. We have an asset management plan. And this has not been forever that this has happened, but the building blocks were there. And so it made it possible. Our asset management plan has come together in the last six years. And I'm really proud of where we are because we can say, okay, we are saving money for this project for replacing our buildings for all of these things we have to next year we have to buy a 1.6 million dollar fire truck we have money set aside that will pay for for a large portion of that so we're not just debenturing 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 like maxing ourselves out um so the financial piece to me has afforded us the luxury of being able to do some pretty fun other projects like our solar farm even our stormwater berm where it's like, you know, we turned the stormwater berm, it's functional, it acts as a dam, basically, to keep water from coming in. But it is also now, we almost doubled the, the how many kilometers of walking trails we have, sorry, not doubled. Um, we added on significant amounts of, of walking trails and nature, nature specific walking trails. Most of our paths and trails and sex month are paved. So we did decided to do more of a rustic thing on the top of the berm. It cost us to put it in while we were constructing was an extra, I think it was an extra 300,000 out of a $6 million project um, to put that on there. 
But what it does is it makes it a beautiful place to live. We have wetlands on one side, we have community on the other. Uh, and people love that walking trail. You can take your bikes up there, you can go around, it's a looped path. And so it just adds to the community. But the reason we can make that choice is that we have been really responsible with money in the past. So, so that to me is, is number one for us. The second one goes back to the comment I just made about the Elks and some of our other groups. We have incredibly strong partnerships within our community. And so it doesn't matter to me if your government, a not-for-profit, a business, whatever it is, everyone has a role to play. And we really pride ourselves in most of our um, town owned buildings, so uh, recreation buildings like our arena and curling rink and community center and uh, multi-purpose sort of community hub. Those are all run by societies. We own them, but we don't, we don't, <laughs> I mean, we do take care of them. We do put in money for them so that they're not costing those organizations money, but, but it becomes a partnership. So they're investing in their own community but they're also able to then do some really cool things with those um, with those buildings too. And I'll, I'll highlight the Elks here again, because they run our, our, we call it the Civic Center. It's a multi-purpose building. So it's the Citizens on Patrol, the Legion, the Elks, the library. And, uh, and then we have a big meeting space. It's used, it's been used in the past by, literally every single other group in the community and it gets used for funerals and remembrance day and whatever. It's like they can use that as a hub to continue to grow their own organization. And, and it benefits us because we have somebody who wants to see it do well, but it benefits them because they don't have to then try and find another space and try and try and, you know, fight council for for support on things when we're working together we do so much more and and i mean our museums schools churches like you name it everybody we have a we have a uh non-denominational um bible college in sexsmith that um has been here almost as long as the town has been here it was built in 1933 but it has, it's like having that organization within our community, whether or not you agree with them uh, faith-wise or theologically, if we're working together with them or any other organization, we actually can go so much farther. And, and I know every community has things like that, but I feel like Sexsmith does, um, does a really good job of connecting those things. And you may hear from all of our organizations say, that's eh, <laughs> Like you can always do things better, but I think we do a great job of that and, and really build that community piece that is necessary for community, for towns to succeed. I wonder into my last segment here because I'm cautious of time and I know that you have uh, other important <laughs> things that you have to go pick up here shortly. So I want to, I want to talk about my favorite subject and I think it's your favorite subject as well, because you and a counselor from Wembley, Alberta are part of the municipals, which is a tourism group that talks about uh, the small town tourism fields. And I, I know you haven't done an episode about Sexsmith, but I want to ask you as a tourist coming through Sexsmith soon, yes. as someone ha who has listeners and viewers from across Canada and around the world, what are the, the hidden gems of your community that you boast about all the time? And you say, if you come to our community, you need to stop here and see this. Well, you know, I feel like we should have started here because I could talk your ear off when it comes to this sort of stuff. It's true. I, I do love, I do love the tourism and all those like awesome things that you just don't know exist. And uh, for me, I think, okay, so the number one for me is uh, we always have something happening in the community. And so we're, we're sort of anchored by two sort of stellar events that we really pu push heavy into. Um, Chautauqua Day in the summer, which is like old timey fair. <laughs> I know Chautauqua technically means like tying two moccasins together or, or putting a, um, a tying around a bag in the middle. But really what it means is gathering. And so um, 
so it's a, uh, it's really a gathering of community and we get people from all over who come to Chautauqua. There's a parade that still throws candy. Uh, <laughs> so um, parade, car show, I know <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, lots of food, lots of demonstrations, pancake breakfast, rides for the kids, bouncing castles, like you name it. It's always a great time. Uh, council always dresses up as a specific character. We've been Waldo the last two years. So there's seven Waldos wandering around the community, which is a really fun picture moment. <laughs> um, and then in the winter, we have our Christmas and sex with, which is coming up next weekend. So in like the November 24th weekend, which if you think of um, like a Hallmark movie, marrying great shopping and experiences, that's Christmas in Sexment. So our whole downtown is lit up. The businesses all participate and light up. We have uh, two huge markets that draw people from everywhere. <laughs> it's all handmade, homegrown, like this lovely mug I got at, at the market last year. Um, it's really about sort of um, engaging in Christmas and building community at the same time. So those to me sort of anchor everything else that we do when it comes to events, but we have stuff that runs all year round, little, um, yeah, events put on by, by both us and groups in the community. Um, we have boutique shops, like, I can't hear you. Are you muted? I did mute myself because I coughed and I forgot to unmute myself. I was, I was about to say, um, uh, you're about to say something about the Elks, aren't you? And then I was going to throw shade at you saying, are you getting paid under the table by the Elks to promote them as much as possible on this show? I joke, but uh, it sounds like no. it's a truly family friendly neighbor community that there's something for everyone. It's awesome. And I'll, I'll make a funny little commentary. I sit on an Alberta municipalities board and, um, the chair of that board, Andrew Knack from Edmonton, who I enjoy, he said, um, okay, today we're going to say what's your favorite community in Alberta that is not your home community and, and a reason why. And so we're going around the table, um, the intergovernmental affairs manager from Grand Prairie, Rory Tarrant says, he goes first, he says, so my favorite community outside of Gro uh, outside of my own town, Grand Prairie, is Sexsmith. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, because of Chautauqua Day, Christmas in Sexsmith. It feels like home, even if you don't live here. It's like coming home. And that's exactly, that's exactly what we want about our town, that everyone is home, even if you don't live here. <laughs> and, and that's where our other things that we do, I think, really drive that. Um, so when I think of our little shops and restaurants, you go in, it's like people know you, even if you have never walked through the door before, they're very friendly. That says a lot about your community. I mean, we're fortunate that we have some boutique shops that are, we have hippie strings, which is all about yarn. And, and that's way outside of my world. I do not knit or crochet or do anything like that. I love going in there because they're in our historic train station. So they have tons of cool things. It's all historically done. The museum is a fantastic stop. And I know people are like, oh, museums, but <laughs> we are very fortunate. Oh, good. good. I love museums. <laughs> if you have a museum, I come to your community. If you don't, <laughs> <laughs> I joke. Well, then, yeah. I joke for anyone who doesn't have a museum who's coming on my show. I love these. I love all communities. Um, but I am cautious of time, and I have one last question for you. And I apologize, but I, because you said you could probably speak for an hour, but I want to ask the million dollar question right now because I think this is the more important question, and that is, in your opinion, and take as long as you want to answer this. In your opinion, what makes the town of Sexsmith such a unique place to live? to work and to raise a family uh it's me no and i say that <laughs> i'm gonna qualify that but it's me and it's my neighbor and it's the person down the street who greets you when you walk into the post office and it's the person at hippie strings who treats you like family even when you're not family 
And it's the person who, you know, yesterday we just got snow, what feels like for the first time it had all melted and we got snow and people were sliding through intersections. We have this big, we have a four way stop with big ditch on either side and somebody went in. Well, another vehicle of course stopped and pulled them out. And then there were, you know, other people around trying to help and whatever. Um, it is the, um, the reality of our community is that people actually care. And, and that's what makes us great and why other people want to come here is because people, people still care about their neighbor. And, and I know that sounds maybe really cliche and everybody's like, it's always the people. <laughs> it's like, but when you have good people, it makes the community awesome. The fact that I can, you know, the fact <laughs> today, no, yesterday, I got a text from a parent who has a grade six, uh, son in grade six. And she said, Kate, do you want to see what was on the spelling test today? And I was like, sure. And so here she shows me the spelling test. She said, it's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, government, Mayor Kate Potter. <laughs> and then it goes on to all these things. I'm like, who puts the mayor on their spelling test? But I can walk down the street and I have kids who will come right up to me. I always say to them, I when I go into classrooms, if you see me, come and talk to me because I care. I care about what you're doing. I care that you stay out of trouble and don't make mischief for you know, everybody else, I care that you do well. Like I have kids that come up to me and tell me, you know, how they've won something at gymnastics or football. It's like, those are the things that make us succeed well, because people want to invest economically in a community like that. They want to invest tourism wise in, a, in, in our museum society, because that is what we're, it's what we're built on. And it's what we continue to push. And and you can't just make that. Like people come here and they say, oh, it just just feels different. And I'm like, it's because it is different. We all love each other. I mean, we don't stand around and sing kumbaya and hold hands, but, but we could. <laughs> it's like coming home, right? Yeah, it is like coming home. And I don't know how else to describe it because so much of what we do comes out of that. It's intentional. I think it's intentional. And if you don't have the right people at, around the council table or the right people volunteering or in those positions, you lose that because you have to be intentional about keeping that in your desire to grow as a municipality. If I'm just looking for anybody for business and not quality business people, we become cutthroat and it's pointless because we're constantly fighting and bickering amongst each other and, and trying to outdo everybody else. If it's more about community, um, and we have the the pleasure of having numerous businesses that have been in our community for a long time, or people who have chosen to start a business here because they see that difference, and and yeah, to me that's love. Love is the difference, Chris. <laughs> um, Kate, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I, I I I asked for forty minutes. You've given me over an hour of your time. And I appreciate your honesty, your candor, and your willingness to sit down and talk about the issues, but also talk about municipalities, because I truly think they are the most important level of government. And people like you make them more fun, more exciting. And <laughs> honestly, this has been a wonderful cap to a great week on the shows. This will be airing on November 23rd. So if you heard the mayor correctly, head out to Sex Smith, Alberta today, this weekend for their big Christmas in uh, Sex Smith uh, uh, festivities. I can't imagine a better time. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. And I just appreciate that you're doing something like this because I think municipalities get none of the love, but take a lot of the brunt. And, and so it's nice to be able to talk about municipal issues. And now before I let you go, I'm going to throw a little, hopefully if she's actually listening to this, maybe now that you've appeared on the show, your fellow co-host of the municipals and counselor Underwood from Wembley will make an appearance as well. Yes, <laughs> anyway. Emma, come. <laughs> okay. And.
Thank you for joining us for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape communities from across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our show. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. If you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can continue to deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.